You're listening to the Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis, and today we're discussing the fiscal cliff and the state of the economy in the United States. On the 1st of January, after last-ditch talks, President Barack Obama and the Republican leader of the House, John Boehner, agreed to a deal to prevent automatic tax rises and spending cuts, averting the so-called fiscal cliff. If it had come into effect, economists say it could have cut GDP by 5%, sending the US into recession. But a deal between the president and Congress was finally hammered out, raising taxes for the very rich and sending stock markets soaring. Now, just over a week later, some of that optimism has cooled as economists and politicians worry that the deal did nothing about the US government's debts. By March, the federal government will need to get permission to raise its borrowing limit, setting the stage for another fiscal cliff-style confrontation between Democrats and the Republicans. To discuss this, I'm joined now in the studio by Nick Dearden, director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Dr Andrew Moran, senior lecturer from London's Metropolitan University, and by John Hawksmith, chief economist from Price Waterhouse Coopers UK. If I might start with you, Andrew Moran, what exactly is the fiscal cliff? For people who are coming to this discussion might be slightly confused by what they've heard at the new year, what it would actually involve. Well, the fiscal cliff goes back to tax cuts that were passed during the presidency of George W. Bush. In 2001, he pushed through Congress tax cuts of $1.7 billion that were due to expire within 10 years of being put in place. In 2010, the Republican-controlled Congress agreed to extend the tax cuts for another two years. And this came at a time when there were debates about the debt ceiling, the amount of money that the American government can spend. Barack Obama wanted to put the debt ceiling up, um, but the Republicans got into a very heated debate with the White House, which saw both issues effectively kick down the road to December 31st, 2012. If the tax cuts had lapsed on December 31st, you would have had a, had a situation where tax increases of $536 billion would have come into place, along with spending cuts of $109 billion across the board, both domestically and in the military. What concerned economists about this was that this would pull out approximately 4 to 5% of growth in the American economy, probably leading to a recession, having a global impact. And domestically, most Americans would have seen their taxes go up. And John Hawksworth, what would have been the impact on the economy if the fiscal cliff, if America had actually fallen off that cliff? Well, I think, as Professor Moran said, if you take 4 or 5% out of an economy that's only likely to be growing at about 2 2.5%, then you're down to minus sort of 2.5% or something like that, and so you're back into recession. So had, had they done nothing uh, and had that followed through completely, you could have been back into recession. Now, there may have been some offsets, so it may not have been quite so bad as that. But basically, when an economy is weak... You, know, you don't want to hit them with such big tax rises and spending cuts. So uh, we would have seen, say, unemployment breach the 10% barrier, that sort of thing? Well, I think you would certainly have seen you know, potentially you know, zero or negative growth, unemployment rising again, and you know, basically it would have had a confidence effect as well. And, of course, it would have affected uh, the US as trading partners like the UK as well. So it would have had a range of negative effects if you'd have had that bigger fiscal tightening in one so- go. Is it fair to call, say, a 5% drop a sort of catastrophic drop in the economy? Thing? Well, I think by comparison, you know, that's the sort of uh, drop in GDP we saw in the UK, about 6% or so in, in our recent recession in 2008-9. So it's something of the same order of magnitude uh, as that, basically. And the fiscal cliff was averted. Barack Obama and the Republicans came to an agreement on the 31st of December, 1st of January, which was then passed by both houses. What has happened with that agreement since? Because it seems to come across that Barack Obama actually did quite a good deal, got tax rises for the highest paid. Well, I I don't know. I mean, there was a compromise, I think, from an economic perspective. You know, there will be tax rises, but they'll be of a much smaller magnitude than than would have been the case had all of these... uh, uh, plan things gone through. You know, I think there was a debate as to how far down the income distribution the tax rises should bite and how large they should be, what the what the distribution impacts. And I, I guess neither side got exactly what they wanted, but as expected, there was last minute horse trading and they got some sort of a reasonably sensible deal, more or less what economists had expected, actually. I mean, economists had already factored in the fact there would be some tax rises this year. And indeed, you need probably some tax rises and spending 
uh, control in order to get the deficit down gradually. But you want to do that gradually over a, a period of years. You don't want to do it in one big hit. But in many cases, they've just put off the decisions on spending and and put off some of the tough decisions, uh, and so they're going to have to come back to them you know, in coming months and indeed years. Nick, you've got a record of saying that you think that President Obama gave away too much. He was initially hoping to get sort of um, tax rises on people earning, say, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and that got pushed up to four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand. He could have done much more, definitely. In fact, he promised to do much more um, before the election, um, and far, give far bigger tax rises to the rich. And the fact that he that he hasn't made those tax is going to mean that the spending cuts have to be greater when they come in. Now, one of the things that we're really worried about is that the, the, certainly there is a there is a debt problem. Um, whether it's a debt, I think the debt crisis is somewhat manufactured um, in the United States, but certainly there's a debt problem. U.S. debt is is, is too high uh, in the long term. Um, it's not a good idea to, to 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 cut it at this at this time. I would I would certainly agree with. But the real crisis in U.S. society is the private debt problem, which is absolutely enormous, um, far outstrips. Uh, 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 public debt in, in the way that it's been rising recently. Um, and why has this come about? Because the types of policies that the United States has followed for 30 years now have inflicted deep levels of inequality and deep levels of poverty on US society. And unless, unless the United States deals with that problem, then the debt crisis will continue. We'll continue getting the private debt crisis for sure, and probably the public debt crisis too, will continue getting bigger because inequality and debt are necessarily tied together. And what we've seen working on scores of countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and now looking at Europe too, is that actually when you try and deal with a debt crisis through austerity, you get horrendous levels of poverty, you get soaring levels of inequality, you have real problems with um, faith in your democratic institutions and your democratic system. And ironically, the debt also goes up as well. And we've seen this in country after country after country. So unless the United States does something to fundamentally restructure the way its economy works and deal with inequality in its society, um, I fear that there isn't going to be a, a solution to the debt problem. Fine. Then what concrete measures do you have to put forward that wouldn't actually increase the debt? If you're saying there's inequality, that would seem to indicate that you think the lower paid should get help from government, which would increase yep. debt, surely. It would. And I think in the short term, that, that may be something that's necessary to do. But I also think you can limit the amount that, by, the, that you increase debt by, by taxing those who've done extremely well in the last 30 years. And in the United States, just as globally, the super rich have done enormously well. I mean, their wealth has grown beyond imagination in the, in the last 30 years, um, to the point where very rich corporations and the super rich barely pay tax anymore in the United States and also at a global level. And we have to do something about that by clamping down um, on tax havens and the way that people escape from, from taxes, but also by looking at more progressive taxation. So, I mean, I mean the, the level at which um, corporations and rich people are taxed has gone down and down and down and down. And that means there's, le there's less public spending, there's less of an idea that redistribution is a good thing that, that, that there was 30 years ago, and we need to, to uh, re reassess some of those ideas. You're listening to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today we're discussing the fiscal cliff and the state of the economy in the United States. I'm joined in the studio by Nick Dearden, director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Dr Andrew Moran, senior lecturer from London's Metropolitan University, and by John Hawksworth, Chief Economist from Price Waterhouse Coopers UK. John, do you think that's true, that the rich have been let off too much of the burden? Well, I, I guess it's a political judgment and one has to make on that. I think it's certainly true that rich people and large company, corporations have more options than the average person uh, about how they manage their tax affairs. And I think in the past, maybe there have been too many options to use tax havens and other things. Um, you know, ultimately, it's then a question of getting a globally coordinated response, though, because there's no point in just trying to put up taxes on the rich in one country, because they will just move their money somewhere else. I mean, the, the big characteristic of uh, wealthy people or, or big corp corporations is they're very mobile internationally. And so you, you're just going to cut off your nose to spite your face if you try and do it on a unilateral basis. Uh, you know, it has to be more of a coordinated thing. There's been some moves through the OECD. You can see in terms of the way in which, just in Europe, the way in which Swiss banks, for example, are now being coming under pressure both from the US and from other uh, 
legislations to kind of open up their banking system and, and to be less secretive. It's, but it's uh, quite interesting. Some of the people who've been accused of tax evasion in, in Greece, for example, it's now been discovered they, they moved their money, first of all, to Switzerland. They said, oh, that's a bit dangerous. So they've now moved it to Singapore. Well, this is probably why you ultimately you do need a global approach, because unless you have a comprehensive global approach... Is that all, realistic, though, a completely global well, approach? Well, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, you, there has to be some sort of coordination for groups like the G20 and other such bodies to try and achieve it. But, you know, it, it's it's not it's it's a it's a complex long term process. Um, I think it's it's rather a different issue from the U.S. fiscal cliff issue, to be honest. Uh, but it's it's something on which you know I think there has been movements in the direction, and you can see it in the U.K. De- debate, where I think you know I think it, there has been increasing recognition that companies that aren't seem to be paying you know, a fair share of tax you know, do have a consumer backlash against them, and so it is a debate that will no doubt go on. In, in many countries, but not the US, UK and others. Uh, Dr. Moran, uh, sorry, you want to come in? No, I, th- I think it's very interesting that, that what we're seeing in America now in, in the background is a debate about this divide between the wealthy and the poor. That you know, Barack Obama had a, a clear policy of, of trying to increase taxes on the rich. The Republicans were opposed to any tax increases. Their solution is spending cuts. Um, but Obama, though he, he didn't get the 250 thousand dollar limit that he wanted he did compromise on the four hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit for families the four hundred thousand for individuals but it it struck me as very interesting that one of the losers in this process has actually been john boehner the um, house republican leader who came up with plan b which was to introduce a taxes for those earning a million dollars and upwards and his own party his own party rejected, rejected what he that. said yes it, it, it didn't it was too too low a figure they considered that you shouldn't actually be taxing anybody but in the end the republicans realized that in, in the public relations war it was being won by barack obama but there is this clear divide that's developed between the super rich as nick said and and the middle classes in america and it's been developing since the 1970s middle class wages have stagnated uh, poor members of society find it increasingly difficult to to survive um, whereas there is a small group of people at the top who have have made hay whilst the sun shines why do you think american politics has gone this way people have accepted the argument perhaps sort of following on from ronald reagan that low taxes increase economic growth i think there is a, there is a, a core group of individuals who 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 believe that neoliberal idea but you know i mean reagan policies in a sense were keynesian he ran up huge deficits increased military spending during his presidency whilst cutting taxes it doesn't work you can't do that uh, we we found that during the the presidency of george w bush what I think is, is happening now is that I think we may enter into a debate about where economic policy goes in future. And, and the, the, the cutting taxes uh, approach may be one that people begin to question. But at the moment, it, it's the dominant idea. But I, but I do think there are signs of it being questioned. We do also have a problem moving on from the fiscal cliff, is that this was signed 1st of January, and now in March we'll have a new economic crisis talking about the, the government debt levels. How do you see that playing out in March? Same debate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, March is the new December. What I think will happen is that the Republicans will now ask for spending cuts, that they will not do a deal on the debt ceiling unless there is some evidence of spending cuts coming in. And I think invariably it's going to be a very nasty fight. Uh, Nick, you must be quite fearful of of what the impact of those spending cuts would be. Yeah, I mean, if you look at um, some of the incredible levels of poverty that exist in the United States, extraordinary, really, for for the richest country in the world, for for any OECD country, for any industrialised country, it could have a real impact. But I think there's something really interesting in, in, in what Andrew said, that, that in many ways, the US economy, which has led economic thinking in, in many ways over the last 30 years, is, is not a true believer in, in the free market. It totally understands the role of the state in uh, allowing for the free market to function. The problem is not even necessarily to do with how much they've been spending, but where they've been spending it. And one of the big debates, I hope, that will come up in, in March is actually, why are we spending this huge amount of money on our military, which is a form of corporate welfare, essentially, like a lot of American spending. And I'm certainly not saying that a, that, a, that a government shouldn't support industries that it wants to support. But when your country is spending more on its military than the rest of the world combined, there is some problem there. I think what they're finding now is that there are some, there are some true believers in the United States, the Tea Party and the Republicans influenced by the Tea Party, who genuinely do believe the rhetoric of neoliberalism. And they're coming up against these people who actually understand that you can't simply leave, econ- leave the economy to the 
free market. And that's it's an interesting debate. But what I'm worried about is that we move away from actually looking at how you run a fair economy and a fair society and how you allow people to have some control over the economy and the country that they're living in. Because without that, what form of democracy really is there? John Hawksworth, where do you think they're going to have to make cuts? There'll be probably a broad range of things that they will have to cut. I mean, I think there probably will be some attempt to economise on military spending. I think there will be some attempt to, you know, having pulled back from some of the uh, activities in the Middle East in the sense that maybe al-Qaeda is a bit less of a threat than it was. I think there might be some sort of toning down of that. But clearly there will also be pressure on some other areas of, you know, welfare spending as well. So, you know, I think there will be the same kind of horse trading, the same kind of compromise where, you know, Democrats get a, a bit of what they want on the military spending and the Republicans get a bit of what they want on the welfare budget. And, you know, no one is totally happy, but no, but everyone has something that they can point to as, as being on their side. And I think this is just the way in which it will continue to go in the US. You know, for the moment, it just seems like we'll get these continual impasses for a number of years. And these problems won't go away quickly. I mean, the US still has a very big budget deficit, you know, getting, you know, eight, nine, ten percent of GDP, it's going to take a long time for that to come down. And then it has a longer term problem with an aging population, like many other countries have, that puts pressure on uh, other forms of spending on pensions and healthcare. And, and, and these issues will also be very politically charged, because, you know, how you address those issues will have important distributional consequences. So, But are programmes like Social Security and Medicare, ones the problems are particularly eyeing them for other cuts, do you think that those, that those cuts would actually help? Well, I mean, I think ultimately, as I say, I don't think you would, in the current fragile economy, you probably wouldn't want, you know, absolutely huge cuts in spending. It's very interesting for someone from, from PwC saying, well, you don't need cuts now. Well, you, might need, more some, you might need some, some you know, you clearly, you, you know, I think everyone would agree that you know, people will look for efficiency improvements in government as, as in everywhere else. There may be certain areas where you can cut spending um, in, in a way that isn't so damaging. But, but ultimately... You know, you have to do this in a measured way. You know, I mean, I, th- I think in a situation where the economy is still quite fragile, it doesn't make sense to you know to swing a big sort of spending act. You you have to approach the, the deficit reduction in a in a phased way, and I expect that that's what will happen. There will be some horse trading. There will be uh, some sort of deal, but it will it will be a sort of a, a medium term program of gradually getting the deficit down. So you're you're quite in agreement with uh, Nick Dearden here, which is quite surprising. For well, some I mean, I think in, in general terms, most economists would agree that in a situation where the economy is quite fragile, you have to take your time and gradually reduce the deficit over time and not try and do something dramatic. I think there tends to be sometimes an exaggeration of a political difference. In the UK, for example, there's a lot of political to and forth. But in fact, when you look at the numbers, there's not that much difference between the parties at the last election in terms of how they were addressing the deficit. Their plans weren't that different in terms of the overall numbers. It was exaggerated a lot in terms of the political sort of to and fro. Both parties basically agreed, Alistair Darling on the one hand and you know, George Osborne on the other in the UK, that you needed to reduce the deficit. They, ha- they both had plans that involved quite big spending cuts and and quite big tax rises, and they dif- disagreed a bit on some of the detail and how fast you go. But o- often these sort of uh, political things get sort of turned into a bigger debate. But actually, you know, the, the overall, from an economic point of view, the general strategy of a gradual medium term program for, for reducing the deficit is one that you know, most economists would probably be agree with. And the rest is kind of political. Uh, horse trading as to how you do that at the level of detail. Uh, Dr Moran, we have these apparently recurring crises in American economic and political life. Um, Does this say something about the American political system itself? Yes, it's dysfunctional. I mean, the Constitution, I'm a a great supporter of it. It encourages compromise, it encourages deliberation, but at the moment there's an element that it seems to be becoming a suicide pact, that the different arms of government because they're becoming polarised, are unwilling to work together and seek that, that compromise. And in many cases, it's very small groups that are controlling this debate, the, the Tea Party that Nick referred to, but there are also left-wing elements of the Democratic Party who are very ideological and don't want to see uh, spending cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, in Social Security. And then on the other side, there are the Tea Party members who don't want to see any, any form of taxation whatsoever. And the difficulty now is getting these groups to compromise. Um, and it seems to be an ongoing problem. And I think it's very bad for America internationally that, that governments around the world, people around the world, are looking at a political system that doesn't seem to be able to, to work effectively at the moment. Barack Obama is trying his hardest. I think. I think that you know the leaders in the in the House and in the Senate are, from both sides are trying their hardest. But there are these groups 
that are very ideological in nature and the voting system allows them to block certain things and make it very difficult for politicians to act effectively. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that's been said is, that is the military budget. The military budget is one thing that I think could be looked at. It's quite clear now that America has a view that it needs to scale down its global responsibilities. We've, we've seen this recently in discussions with NATO, where the, the, the government has made it clear that they want European countries to play a larger role in NATO, particularly financially. That seems quite an unrealistic prospect at the moment, though. Yes, <laughs> ob ob obviously, but I think it, but it's indicative, you know, obviously particularly bearing in mind the situation in Europe, but I think it's indicative of a presidency that has the view that America needs long term to balance it, but its books. Military spending is one of those areas, particularly with new technologies. Rather than putting troops on the ground, we have new technologies that they're using which are much cheaper, which would enable some scaling back, other countries taking on greater responsibilities. But in Congress, there are congressmen, congresswomen and senators who are backed by special interests who are not going to allow that to happen or will fight very hard to ensure that those things don't happen. Is it fair to say that most of those are on the on the right, uh, Tea Party supporters, basically? No, not necessarily. I mean, you know, the most of the politicians... I was just thinking of John Boehner's uh, problems getting his own his plan for a budget through and that being scuffered by his own party, for example, as, a, as sort of one way of this, function, this system being dysfunctional. Well, it's dysfunctional in that minorities can prevent major policy initiatives occurring. And is that because the way the Constitution is written or the way the sort of balance of power is held is that it's quite difficult for an executive to get through its legislation unscathed? Yes, it's extremely difficult. You know, John F. Kennedy very famously said the president proposes and Congress disposes. And we're in that situation now. But, but, but I think, you know, having spoken to a lot of ex-congressmen, that they're very unhappy with the way that Congress is functioning now. They've never seen it so polarised. You're listening to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today we're discussing the fiscal cliff and the state of the economy in the United States. I'm joined in the studio by Nick Dearden, director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Dr Andrew Moran, senior lecturer from London's Metropolitan University, and by John Hawksworth, chief economist from Price Waterhouse Coopers UK. So, Nick, your take is perhaps in the past, in maybe Eisenhower's America, we might have had compromise, but now that's not possible. I mean, in some ways I agree, in some ways I don't agree. A lot of people have referred to America as the imperial presidency as a, as a system, for example. In terms of the incredible power that it, it exerts, you know, there's, there, there's very little democratic accountability to that. But at a congressional level, I, I would also argue there's not that much democratic accountability. One of the things I was reading earlier was an article which suggested that maybe Congress men and women should adopt the same policy as sportsmen and women and have all their sponsors on the uh, suits that they <laughs> wear because the level of money that you have to... That that is required to be elected to any office in the United States mean you are, means you are bound to be captured by um, special interests. In the United States, it's perfectly legal. In fact, there's just been a, a law passed a couple of years ago now um, that increased the amount that corporations could spend on supporting and sponsoring US politicians. It, it's morally utterly corrupt. And it's, it's no wonder, therefore, that m many, many people in the country, the majority, the vast majority of most elections, don't even vote. And I think Obama promised an enormous amount and obviously created an enormous uh, wave of enthusiasm and a big movement behind him. And many people have been have felt very despondent about what he's actually managed to achieve in office because he simply is unable to. He is coming up against these vested interests all the time. And that's where the Tea Party comes from in, in many ways. I mean, I, I thoroughly disagree with the politics that they're espousing, but I do understand that many Americans want to have a more democratic system and don't feel they have one because they can't control any form of, of policy making. John, do you think that the American political system has actually held back the recovery in that it's forced Obama to, to, he couldn't do things he wanted to do, for example. Well, I think it certainly restricted his ability to, you know, to develop a strategy and carry it through. Uh, so in, in that sense, it, has, it probably hasn't been helpful. And I think that there have certainly been these incidents around debt ceiling debates in mid-2011 and again more recently where it, you know, it hasn't really increased the international confidence in America, the fact that they haven't seemed to be able to uh, to reach a sort of sensible political solution in, in a reasonable time scale, and they're always doing this at the last minute. You know, rather like we see in Europe, you know, where you keep getting these last minute deals on Greece or Spain or Italy or whatever, and this doesn't exactly increase market confidence in these countries and therefore adds to their problems. Uh, so, I mean, I think that there are, 
but, but, but I think one just has to accept that he inherited an incredibly difficult economic situation and it was never going to be that easy for him to have any kind of miracle cures. You know, uh, and the political situation has made it even harder, but, but, but fundamentally it was a, a difficult situation going in economically. OK, I'm going to ask you, this after, we're going to have the last few minutes left, look into your crystal balls, really, and say, if we were looking at America in, say, a year's time, what do you think would have changed? Nick, if I could start with you. I think I agree with what's been said, that a compromise will emerge um, and it will be a messy compromise and both sides in, in Congress will get something they want. The problem with that is, as I say, it does not solve the really deep-rooted problems in the American system. And I come back to uh, this idea that, that democracy and inequality need to be looked at as a matter of great urgency. And the United States needs to work out how it manages its, its relative decline economically in the global sphere in a way that is equitable for its people and equitable and sustainable for the rest of the world. World, and at the moment, it's nowhere near that. But in concrete terms, how would you see them tackling this this inequality? How would I like them to do it? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I mean, more public spending, uh, a, 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 a more taxation of, of, of the super rich and also a reining in of the financial system that's allowed those super rich to become so so rich in the first, in the first place. The idea that the government um, can play an extremely important democratic role in the management of the economy and the economy should be accountable um, to ordinary people. Um, and with that, I hope would go a scaling down of the of the of the military budget um, and less US intervention and imposition of policies that it doesn't even follow itself for the rest of the world. Dr Moran, where do you see America in, say, a year's time? Same place. I, th- I think what does need... need Sorry, to... the same place as Nick or the <coughs> same place it is now? Same, same place it is, as it is now. I, I think that we will have a, a series of ongoing compromises. But what I hope we, we will see is that there will be a growing acceptance that long term America has a substantial debt problem that needs to be addressed. The, the, as John has referred to, the aging population, the problem with uh, an unsustainable entitlements budget, Medicaid, Medicare and Social Security are effectively going to be bankrupt in the foreseeable future. And there needs to be some long term solution to that. What we're, what we're seeing at the moment are short term solutions, sticking plasters. But there, is, there, is, there are serious long term problems that the American economy has. The, the debt at the moment is $16.4 trillion. With the program that's just been enacted, it's going to go up in the next 10 years by another $4 trillion at least. It's unsustainable long term. And finally, John, a year's time, will we look back and say, gosh, it's more of the same or we've actually made some progress? I think I would probably agree with what Professor Moran has said. There will be some compromises. I think the economy will probably manage 2% or so growth. So things might look a little bit better in terms of the economic situation. Um, but I don't think there will be a radical change. And I think the r- really key issues are long term, you know, as America just comes to terms with the fact that China and India and other economies you know, in future decades are going to be much more important. The dollar will, you know, eventually in 20, 30 year times no longer be the single reserve currency. So if the US just pumps out government bonds, you know, people won't just absorb them in the same way as they've been doing in recent years. And therefore, ultimately, you know, America will have to live within its means much more, both in the public sector and the private sector. And it will also have to reform its private healthcare system, which is hugely expensive, I mean, much more so in many ways than you know, the public health system, it's, it's, it takes a huge proportion of American GDP and will only increase as the population ages. And actually trying to get that under control is almost one of the biggest challenges it faces. OK, that's all we have time for. A slightly depressing note to finish on if you're an American. Thank you to my guests, Nick Dearden, the director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Dr Andrew Moran, senior lecturer at the London Metropolitan University, and John Hawksworth, chief economist from PwC UK. Thank you all very much. Ten percent barrier, that sort of thing. Well, I think you would certainly have seen, you know, potentially, you know, zero or negative growth, unemployment rising again, and you know, basically, it would have had a confidence effect as well. And of course, it would have affected uh, the US as trading partners like the UK as well. So, it would have had a range of negative effects if you'd have had that bigger fiscal tightening in one so- go. Is it fair to call, say, a 5% drop a sort of catastrophic drop in the economy, thing? Well, I think by comparison, you know, that's the sort of uh, drop in GDP we saw in the UK, about 6% or so in, in our recent recession in 2008-9. So it's something of the same order of magnitude uh, as that, basically.
And the fiscal cliff was averted. Barack Obama and the Republicans came to an agreement on the 31st of December, 1st of January, which was then passed by both houses. What has happened with that agreement since? Because it seems what I missed about this was that this would pull out approximately 4 to 5% of growth in the American economy, probably leading to a recession, having a global impact. And domestically, most Americans would have seen their taxes go up. And John Hawksworth, what would have been the impact on the economy if the fiscal cliff, if America had actually fallen off that cliff? Well, I think, as Professor Moran said, if you take 4 or 5% out of an economy that's only likely to be growing at about 2 2.5%, then you're down to minus sort of 2.5% or something like that, and so you're back into recession. So had, had they done nothing uh, and had that f- followed through completely, you could have been back into recession. Now, there may have been some offsets, so it may not have been quite so bad as that, but basically when an economy is weak... You, know, you don't want to hit them with such big tax rises and spending cuts. So uh, we would have seen, say, unemployment breach the tensions worry that the deal did nothing about the US government's debts. By March, the federal government will need to get permission to raise its borrowing limit, setting the stage for another fiscal cliff style confrontation between Democrats and the Republicans. To discuss this, I'm joined now in the studio by Nick Dearden, Director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Dr Andrew Moran, Senior Lecturer from London's Metropolitan University, and by John Hawksmith, Chief Economist from Price Waterhouse Coopers UK. If I might start with you, Andrew Moran, what exactly is the fiscal cliff? For people who are coming to this discussion might be slightly confused by what they've heard at the new year, what it would actually involve. Well, the fiscal cliff goes back to tax cuts that were passed during the presidency of George W. Bush. In 2001, he pushed through Congress tax cuts of $1.7 billion that were due to expire within 10 years of being put in place. In 2010, the Republican-controlled Congress agreed to extend the tax cuts for another two years. And this came at a time when there were debates about the debt ceiling, the amount of money that the American government can spend. Barack Obama wanted to put the debt ceiling up, um, but the Republicans got into a very heated debate with the White House, which saw both issues effectively kick down the road to December 31st, 2012. If the tax cuts had lapsed on December 31st, you would have had a situation where tax increases of $536 billion would have come into place, along with spending cuts of $109 billion across the board, both domestically and in the military. What concern... You're listening to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today we're discussing the fiscal cliff and the state of the economy in the United States. On the 1st of January, after last-ditch talks, President Barack Obama and the Republican leader of the House, John Boehner, agreed to a deal to prevent automatic tax rises and spending cuts, averting the so-called fiscal cliff. If it had come into effect, economists say it could have cut GDP by 5%, sending the US into recession. But a deal between the President and Congress was finally hammered out, raising taxes for the very rich and sending stock markets soaring. Now, just over a week later, some of that optimism has cooled as economists and politicians